Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome you once again to Exmouth Chapel's Sunday worship service. It's a privilege to be able to minister to you today. Uh, and we'd like to, to welcome you and uh, invite you to take part in everything that goes on today as we sing, as we pray, as we read God's word and as we hear it preached. As we begin, uh, we're going to begin with some words from Colossians chapter 3 and they link to what Simon's going to be speaking on later in terms of our mindset um, uh, in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ and the upward call, as it were, of, of God. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Since, says Paul, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And that's our prayer today, that we would set our minds on things above. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ Jesus. We thank you for his saving work, his life, his death, his resurrection. And we thank you that as we've just read, that he is seated in a place of honour at your right hand. We thank you that he intercedes for us. And we ask that you would help us as we seek to worship you, to set our minds on things above, on heavenly things, not on earthly things. For our current state is glorious. Our lives are hidden with Christ. And we thank you for that glorious truth. And Lord God, may we live lives that are pointing towards the return of Christ. Lives that are longing for full resurrection, that are longing for the new creation. And we thank you that at this time of his glorious appearing, we will appear with him in glory. Release us from the anxieties, Lord, of this world and set us free to worship you by setting our minds on things above. Help us to worship you rightly today in our homes, in our living rooms. Help us to be worshippers and not spectators. And Lord God, we do ask that you would bless each one of us from your word by your spirit today. In the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Sing we the King who is coming to reign, glory to Jesus the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation his empire shall bring, joy to the nations when Jesus is King. Come let us sing his praise to our King, Jesus our King. Jesus our King, this is our song, who to Jesus belong, glory to Jesus, to Jesus our King. All men shall dwell in his marvellous light, praise his long severed, his love shall unite. Justice and truth from his scepter shall spring. Wrong shall be ended when Jesus is king. Come, let us sing praise to our king. Jesus, our king. Jesus, our king. This is our song, who to Jesus belong. Glory to Jesus. from the burden of sin. Doubt shall not darken his witness within. Hell hath no terrors and death hath no sting. Love is victorious when Jesus is king. Come let us sing praise to our King. Jesus our King. Jesus, 
kingdom of Christ for thy coming, we pray. Hasten, O Father, the dawn of the day, when this new song thy creation shall sing. Satan is vanquished and Jesus is King. Come, let us sing. A few verses later on from the passage that we read to begin with, Paul speaks of the unity that has come as a result of the resurrection. The resurrection has changed everything. He says, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. And he speaks of the unity that the resurrection has brought, that God is uniting a people to serve him and follow him and it's in that unity that we come to God in prayer uh, as a church and so let's pray as Christ's united people this morning united in him let's pray our heavenly father we come in the name of your son the Lord Jesus Christ who has made us one in his body who has purchased us and redeemed us with his blood and Lord as we come to you, we do first confess that we need his work to unite us again with, your, with yourself, with our neighbour. We confess that it is not our nature to live in unity, but it is so often our nature to live in selfishness. Even in this week, there will have been times that we have prioritised ourselves over others, prioritised ourselves over the glory of your name, and we confess those times we confess that our sin has caused a rift between us and yourself, that only the Lord Jesus Christ's saving work can heal. And we thank you for the assurance that you have united us as your people in the Lord Jesus Christ, a new humanity. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts for this truth, and we ask that you would kindle our hearts to worship as we consider it, as we move on. And Lord God, we ask that you would be pleased to gather people to yourself here in Exmouth, to gather those who have come across the Christian faith through either Exmouth Chapel or any of the other churches in Exmouth during lockdown. We do pray that you would help them to seek first the kingdom of God and that they would be able to repent and believe and know the peace of sins forgiven, a relationship with you, the living God, and that they would have hope for a glorious future. Lord, we pray for anybody in lockdown who has come across the message of the cross. May they not be deaf to it, may they not be blind to it. But Lord, would you, in your mercy, work in their hearts bring them to faith in Jesus' name. And Lord God, as a congregation, we come as those who are bound for heaven but living on earth. And because of this, we do need to place into your hands various needs of, the, of our fellowship and of those known to us. Lord, as we do so often, we pray once again for those who are grieving from our fellowship, for Peggy, for Barbara, for Olive, and also for the families of others who we have known who have passed away. We pray for the family of Dion Weeks, that they would remember what was said at her funeral. And Lord God, we do pray that as a church, we would be a church that helps our brothers and sisters to grieve, but in a way that is different. We do not grieve as others do, the New Testament says. Lord, help us to grieve well. And we pray, Lord, for sustaining strength, for healing and for encouragement for those who face great pain and discomfort day by day. Lord, we commit to you Di and Tony, Harry and Janet, Gerald and Janet, and also our brother David Falls as he undergoes cancer treatment. 
And we do ask that through suffering and struggle, you would work out your purposes, bring glory to yourself and work for our ultimate good as your people. And Lord God, as we also consider the needs of our fellowship and the needs of our town, we pray for our ministry amongst families, our ministry amongst school children. And we do pray for families and children at this time. And we pray for those returning to homeschooling this Monday. We pray for patience and wisdom for parents and for peace in households. Lord, particularly, we do pray for the families that are associated with Exmouth Chapel. And we ask that you would help them to apply the gospel in those situations. We ask that you would help us in our youth clubs to share the gospel, to declare it clearly. And may our individual testimonies as your people be come across clearly to those that we meet and to those that we speak to. And Lord God, as your chosen people gathered in our local church, as your beloved children, we do ask that you would shape us and fashion us more into the likeness of Jesus. Lord, help us to clothe ourselves with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. May we bear with each other and forgive one another. And thank you that in forgiving we reflect how you have forgiven us. And above all, may we put on love, which binds us all together in perfect unity. And may the peace of Christ rule in our hearts as members of one body called to peace. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name and for his glory and fame. In Jesus' name. Amen.
reading today continues the passage that we looked at last week in Philippians chapter 3 and we're going to read from verse 12 today through to the start of chapter 4, the first verse of chapter 4. Let's read what Paul has to say. This is the living word of the living God. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. To uh, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word.
to the reading um, from Philippians chapter 3 and as you do that let's let's pray for God's help let's pray Heavenly Father we ask that you would incline our hearts to your word that you would open our eyes that we would see wonderful things in it we ask that you would give us whole hearts that seek after the Lord Jesus alone and we pray that you would fill us and satisfy us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Uh, I remember when my sister moved to England to live and to work there. And over the course of the weeks and months, she changed. Her accent started to change. It started to migrate towards Nottingham. And when I pointed this out to her in, in all love and gentleness and care, she denied it. But she was beginning to mimic, mimic the people around her. And it's a very human thing to do, to take on the habits and behaviour of people around us. So much of who we are, so much of what we do is picked up from the people that surround us. The, the book of Proverbs that we're looking at during the week uh, is full of cautions that, that tell us to take great care in who we allow to influence us. It warns us to, to, great, to, to, to take great care in the friends that we have, the close friends, because we inevit inevitably pick up things from them. They influence us. And we've seen that already in, in Philippians. Paul realised that. Paul pointed in, in chapter 2 to the great example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. He told us about Christ's selfless service. He told us about Christ's sacrificial living for the eternal good of others. And he, he shows us that so that we might follow Christ's example. And in chapter 2, he then gives us a further examples, two more examples. Timothy, verse 19 onwards. Epaphroditus, verse 25 onwards. Examples of people who imitated Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 3, we have the example of Paul himself. And he tells us the kind of person that he used to be. 
And then the kind of person that he is now in Christ. And he says in chapter 3 verse 17. Join with others in following my example. Paul wants us to imitate him. He wants us to imitate people like him. People who ultimately imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. So what are the things that make Paul a good role model? What are the things that would make us a good role model to others? And there are two things. The first one that I want to bring out is Paul wants us to press on to know more of Christ. He wants us to press on. He begins by showing us in verse 12 that he is still a work in progress. In verse 10, if you look at it, he, he tells us of his new ambitions. He wants to know Christ. He wants to become like Christ in his death, to be obedient like, like Christ. And there's a sense in which Paul has already achieved those ambitions. He does know Christ. He has become like Christ in the way he lives. But Paul doesn't want us to misunderstand. So he says, verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Again, chapter, verse 13. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. And Paul is saying, I'm not there yet. But I want to be there. Yes, a remarkable change has happened in my life. God has worked in my life. I'm not the man that I used to be. Before, when, before I became a Christian, before Christ encountered me, before he came to me, I opposed his church. And for that, you know, that meant that, that I just didn't write stroppy letters to the local church or to the Exmouth Journal complaining about the church. No, I, I tried to arrest the church. I tried to kill, I tried to stamp out the church. And he says, a great change has been brought about in my life. And Paul can say, I'm not the man that I used to be. But he also says here, I'm not the man that I want to be. Yes, a lot has changed. Praise God. But I'm not there yet. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. He's not perfect. And there have, been, there have been believers, there have been people who have taught that, that you can be perfect throughout church history. People have appeared and they, they suggested that you can be perfect in this life. You can be sinless in this life. There's a, the story of one such person who, who met up with the, the Baptist preacher C.H. Spurgeon. And he explained to Spurgeon that how he had become sinless, how he had become perfect. And you can imagine that Spurgeon on hearing this, he, the stories differ, but he either poured water, a jug of water over this man or a jug of milk over this man's head. And then Spurgeon went on to make the observation that this man's sinless perfection disappeared fairly quickly. And if anyone could have been perfect, it probably would have been Paul, an apostle. He met the risen Lord Jesus. He was the theologian. He was the missionary to the Gentiles. He was one of the, the greatest minds ever. He wrote scripture. But Paul says here, I'm still a work in progress. My L plates are still up. I haven't arrived. But he longs for it to be so. And so he says, I press on. Verse 13, but one thing I do. You see the, the focus? One thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal. I'm sure you remember sports day at school. 
you know, you have the uh, probably 30 meters or maybe even 50 meters, it wasn't that far, but that, that sort of little sprint. I remember my primary school, it was up a hill, up an incline, and you had to sprint up the hill. They wouldn't let you run down the hill, they had to go up the hill. And the advice from the teachers, Mr. Caldwell always, you know, keep looking ahead. Because the temptation of a little boy in that race was you wanted to know where everyone else was. Who's near you? Who's catching you? You wanted to see who's on the line supporting you. You probably wanted to stop and wave to them and acknowledge them. But we need to look ahead. We need to look at the finish line. Straining with every fibre, every sinew to that end. I remember listening to an interview with a, I'm a bit embarrassed to say, it was with a, a Manchester United player. I'm not sure what notion I had listening to that. But he, he was a player who had won lots of trophy, trophies under Alex Ferguson, when Alex Ferguson was the manager. And he, and, and he says the thing that set Ferguson apart from every other manager was his relentless thirst for more success. He, he, he said that they, weren't, they were never really allowed to celebrate when they won a trophy because Ferguson's mind would move, would move on to the next game, to the next competition, to the next trophy. And at, in a more serious level altogether, Paul says, that's what we should be like. Pressing on, pressing on, having that relentless thirst for more of Jesus Christ. And in verse 13 when he says, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. He's not pretending there that the past hasn't happened. He hasn't blanked it out. But through Jesus he's been able to deal with with his past. Whether he's been looking back to his successes, to the high points in his Christian life, maybe how keen we were in our younger days, how we served in this way, or how at that time we made a stand for Christ. But Paul knows that we don't press on for Christ if we're resting on our laurels in the past. Or whether we're looking back at our past and we're, and we're pondering on failures with shame. On a particular decision that we made. Perhaps just a general sense of inadequacy. Or maybe it was, it's repeated failure with one particular sin. And Paul is aware of his past, of his sin. He, he tells, tells us of it in chapter 3 verses 4 to 6 and he, he called himself elsewhere the chief of all sinners but he never allowed his past failures to fill his mind he's been able to sort it out with God and in a way that doesn't distract him from what is ahead he knows he's not there yet, but he longs to get there, to press on, forgetting what is behind, straining to what lies ahead. And it's interesting because, because Paul, when he, when he writes this, he, he's probably 30 years a Christian at this point. He's a mature Christian. But it's interesting, it's the mature Christian who knows that they have a lot more maturing to do. Paul is not happy with where he's at. There's a godly restlessness to Paul's Christian life. And perhaps that's the message we need to hear this morning. Paul might be anticipating as he writes this, some of his readers, you know, they, they've just sat down, they've, they've folded their arms and they're, and they're now saying, well, I'm fine with where I'm at. I'll just stay here a while. I'll settle and maybe I'll, I'll get up and go again in the future. But Paul says, think again. He says in verse 15, all of us 
who are mature should take such a view of things and if on some point you think differently that too, that too God will make clear to you only let us live up to what we have already attained we need to be people who long for more of Christ and want to grow in our relationship with him who want to press on who want to strive and that means there should be two things that characterize us. The first is humility. Humility. Because wherever we are in the Christian life, we have got further to go. We have more of Jesus to see. We have more of him to learn. We have more to change about us. And it's humbling. But also, it should excite us. Because there should be in our minds so much more to look forward to, so much more to learn, so much more to discover about our great God. We have the prospect of getting to know Jesus even better than we know him now. We have the prospect of growing in grace. We have the prospect of God, the one who began a work in us, continuing to work in us, continuing to transform us. And so Paul is a wonderful example because he wants more and more of Christ. And he says here, follow me. Follow me. Not because of where I am, but because of where I am going. So for someone to be a good role model, the first thing that we have to do is that we have to press on press on don't settle press on to have more of jesus christ and the second thing is that to be a good role model we are bound up with jesus christ and his return paul says this whole imitation business is urgent and he goes on to show us in verse 18 why it is because we always copy someone in life. And if we're not seeking godly examples to copy, the danger is that we'll copy ungodly examples. So look at verse 18. For as I have often told you before, and now I say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul's gone through this many times with them. And they need to hear it again. And I guess we do too. And Paul says there are people who are enemies of the cross of Jesus. And he describes in verse 19, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is their shame. Their mind is on earthly th things. And we're not clear on who Paul is referring to. The commentators are are split they argue with each other it might be the religious people who are depending on what they do to to achieve acceptance with god it might be just people who who are normal people who don't believe anything commentators are divided but the main thing is that these people who are somehow in the life of the church and have an influence in the church their life compass is pointing to this world and not to the next. Their mind is on this world and not on the next. That's how you recognise them. And Paul says if we follow their example, if we become defined by the things of this world, he says we become enemies of the cross of Christ. Because the cross contradicts the wisdom of this world. Spurgeon again. Spurgeon was, was once invited to, to view someone's new house. Someone from his church had built a new, a new house. It was a new build and, and they wanted Spurgeon to see it. Uh, and for its day it was a fine house. It was state of the art. It was... 
It had fine art, there were sculptures, there were fine furniture. And at the end of the tour, the man said, Well, Spurgeon, what do you think? And as Spurgeon looked around, then he fixed his eyes on the man and he said this, These are the things that make dying hard. Probably wasn't the react reaction that the man was hoping for. These are the things that make dying hard. And Spurgeon wasn't saying, you know, it's not wrong to have a nice house. He wasn't saying it's not wrong to have wealth. It's not wrong to have things. He's not saying that. But we, but, but we must be aware of the danger of the things of this world becoming our focus. It is a danger if our minds are on earthly things. If that is where our identity is, if that is where our success is, if that is where our meaning comes from, we're in danger. And Paul doesn't just say, don't have your mind on this world. He shows us the alternative. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if you think much about your citizenship. You probably think more about it because of Brexit. I know that the... The Irish passport office has been inundated. But for the Philippians, citizenship was a huge deal. Because Philippi was a Roman colony. It was a mini Rome. The people of Philippi, they, even though there were hundreds of miles from, from Rome, they enjoyed the rights, the privileges, the protection of Rome. And it was Rome that, that defined them. It was Rome that defined how they dressed, how they spoke, the outlook that they, that they had. It was Rome that gave them their identity. They were bound up with Rome. And yet Paul reminds them in verse 20, he says, no, no. He says, no, our citizenship, our real citizenship is not based in Rome. It's not based in Parliament buildings in London. It's not based in Buckingham Palace. It is based in heaven. That is where our ultimate ruler is. That is where our home is found. That is where we're from. That is what it says on our passports. That's what explains who we are and what we're like. We are bound to heaven. That is the citizenship that defines us. And that is why our life compass now is to be pointing ahead and not pointing here. Paul says our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Notice here, Jesus is the one who will bring all things under his control. We can't, our rulers can't. The people that we look most who in this life for meaning and hope can't. And at this moment in time, we need to be praying for our leaders. I have no idea what the answer is to what's going on around us. But what I do know is that Jesus is the one who brings everything under his control. He is the one sitting on the throne. He is the one who has the controls of this universe in his hands. He is the one who knows what he's doing. And what's he going to do when he comes? 
He's not going to throw his weight around. Look at the end of verse 21. When Jesus comes from heaven, one of the things that he will do is transform our bodies so that they will be like his. That's a wonderful reminder that Jesus had a body and he still has a body. He is a transformed resurrection body. And when he returns, he will make our bodies like his. Our bodies, Paul says, did you notice? He says they're lowly. And we know that, don't we? Most of us this week, we've, we've taken medication for one thing or the other. And there are many of us with, with long-term health problems. But listen to what Paul says. He says, being a citizen of heaven means that this is not the only body we're going to have. And when Jesus comes to us, as well as renewing this world, he will transform our bodies and they will be like his glorious body. And all that means is that the age to come is the one for which we live. That is where our hearts should be. That is where our minds should be. And so Paul says, follow the example of those who are bound up with Jesus Christ, who are future-minded, who are homesick for the age to come. It does matter who we imitate. It matters hugely. And Paul rounds things off. Chapter 4 verse 1. Therefore my brothers. You whom I love. And long for my joy. And my crying. That is how you should stand firm in the Lord. Dear friends. Remember back in chapter 1 verse 27. Paul wanted us to live lives worthy of the gospel. So that we would stand firm. And now he says. Part of our standing firm is following the right examples. So let's find the right examples. Let's imitate those who press on, who strive for more of Christ, and those whose identity is bound up with him and his return. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do pray that you would help us to want more of Jesus Christ, to know him better, to be more like him, not to settle for where we are at, not to be content in our Christian lives, but to press on, to press on for the prize that is ahead of us. And help us to remember that that we are people who are citizens of heaven. We are people who are bound to Jesus Christ. That is who we are. And therefore help us that in all we do, that we live out who we are in Christ. Help us not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed in our minds, in our hearts, in our wills heaven thank you that the bodies that we have now are not the only bodies that we will have thank you that the world that we now live in will will not be the ultimate world that we live in and we ask that that hope that that would characterize us that that would shape us. That it would be clear that we are people living for something much better, much greater, the redemption of this world. That's the big thing. That's the great thing that's happening. Help us also to, to follow godly examples. 
and help us to be godly examples that point people to Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen.